Joshua chapter 6, Joshua chapter 6, all right, and uh, we're going to read uh, this chapter. We'll go back over and uh, pick up some. There is an outline there on the bottom part of your bulletin, uh, on the back of it, on the bottom half, uh, Sunday night's uh, message there, if you'd like to follow along with us and uh, be a help to you. As we look at a thought of overcoming some walls that hinder us, overcoming some walls that hinder us, we'll get started, and uh, we're man, we're excited, we're living by faith, we're going forward for the cause of Christ, and things hinder us, right? Uh, that's that's the way it is, all right. And we we need to be make sure that there's not some walls in our life that stop us from going forward, all right? Uh, when when you're stopped, think about it this way. When you get hindered, when you get stopped, souls die and go to hell, all right? When you're hindered, all right, you discourage other Christians. It's just the way it is. And so I want to look at this. We'll look at this Sunday night and the next Sunday night and uh, just some things that will be a help to us. So Joshua chapter number 6, verse number 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thy hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war. Go round about the city once, thus shalt thou do six days. Seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. It shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear... The sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on, and compass the city, and let him that is armed Pass on before the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpet and the re-reward came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people saying, You shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout, then shall ye shout. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about at once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord, and the seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the re-reward came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp, so they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed things, lest ye make yourself accursed, when ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. 
But Joshua had sent the two men that had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house, and bring out thence the woman, and all that she hath, as ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in, brought out Rahab, and her father, and her mother, and her brethren, and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred, and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire, and all that was therein. Only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even to this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth the city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. Here's a familiar story to most of us. We heard it in Sunday school. If you grew up in a Sunday school, you probably heard this story about how Joshua uh, overtook that great city of Jericho. And uh, this morning, uh, as we introduced our theme for the year, we talked about uh, by faith, we want to go forward, we want to do some things. I mean, I tell you what, I, I'm, I get excited about the new year. Amen. I hope that you do too. I hope that you set some spiritual goals in your life. I hope that you're uh, wanting to do some things for the Lord. Uh, I hope that uh, you say, man, I, I want to learn more scripture. I want to read more of the Bible. I want to lead some souls to Christ. Uh, I, I want to attend more church. By faith, I want to do some things. Can I tell you this? As soon as you get excited to do something for the Lord... Here comes the devil. He don't care if you're a mediocre Christian. As long as you keep your testimony to yourself, the devil's just fine. It's the ones that hit their knees of praying. It's the one that grabs some gospel tracts on the way out the door. It's the one that says, you know what, when the, when the house of God's open, I'm going to be there. It's the one that says, you know what, I want to do something great for the Lord in 2022, and by faith I'm going forward and I want to serve him. Hey, I want to tell you, listen, then the devil shows up, all right? And so the devil will use some things in your life. And as we looked at uh, Jericho here, this ancient city of Jericho, uh, it was well built. If you study it out, history tells us it was surrounded by two massive stone walls. The outer wall was six feet thick and 20 feet high. The inner wall was 12 feet thick and 30 feet high. In between, there was a 15-foot guarded walkway, all right, that... Uh, chariots would uh, roam around and guard that wall and so from a military standpoint you'd say man that was a safe place to live that's a safe place to be uh, that that's where that's where you want to live is, is a city of Jericho and the the city of Jericho stood uh, as, as a a physical and a psychological obstacle between the nation of Israel and the promised land it stood in their way and I'm going to tell you something. There's some walls that stand in our way getting to a place of spiritual victory. That's what the promised land was. It was a place of spiritual victory. And so there's some walls, all right, that are kind of in the way sometimes. And uh, I want to know how to get past those walls. I want to know how to do something for the cause of Christ. And, and uh, those walls may be, uh, just by way of introduction, I think I have them there in your bulletin, uh, there may be a besetting sin. It may be something that seems like is always hindering you, all right? It may be something that, that's in your family, uh, maybe what we say is generational, just kind of passed down from uh, generation to generation, and just because you got saved, you still deal with this old man, you still deal with that vice in your life, all right? Hey, when you got saved, you know, an angel didn't come down and sprinkle some dust on you and say, you're never going to sin again. Well, I wish it was that way, but it's not. You still fight that besetting sin in your life. And you say, man, I would get to the promised land. I would get to a place of victory, but I've got this, whatever this may be, in my life, and it seems like I'm always dealing with it. Always comes up. There may be bitterness. There may be a root of bitterness in your life. All right? It, it may be, you know, uh, some people seem like they can just forgive so easy. And then some of us are like, I can't believe they did that to me. Again and again and again. 
and we'll say, I forgive them. All right? I, I went to the altar and I got on my knees and say, Lord, I forgive that person. And then Monday morning you wake up thinking about the same thing. Am I the only one who does that? <laughs> uh, forgiveness is not, not so easy, is it? All right? It, it, may be, it may be a root of bitterness in there. And, and you're dealing with that. Man, I, I've known some pastors that, man, they just couldn't pastor the way they ought to because somebody, so maybe some church member had done something to them, and it was just a root of bitterness there, and they had to deal with that. I've known laymen in the church that had to deal with that root of bitterness. All right? Hey, guess what? I don't know why this is, but sometimes Christians can be some of the meanest people I know. <laughs> so how do you know? Because I'm a Christian, all right? <laughs> and, I, and I work with other Christians, all right? That's just the way it is, all right? And so I'm telling you, listen, we need to learn to forgive. We need to learn to get past, all right? And there's some wounds that get opened up, all right? Let me just stop, by the way, and just say this. Whatever it is that gets between you and I or different brothers and sisters in Christ, get that dealt with as soon as you can. Amen. Get that dealt with. It's going to happen because we're all human. It, it, some, it might not even be intentional. Might not even be intentional. You know what? Sometimes I have to go to people and say, you know what? I, honestly, my intent was not to offend you. I did. I'm sorry. You know what? If you approach that like that, like I'm the one that did wrong and not pointing fingers, it'll work out a lot, a lot, of, a lot of times. Because they'll say, oh, you know what? That was me too. That was me too. And so bitterness, it might be a besetting sin. It might be bitterness. It might, it might be a bad attitude. Yeah. It might, be, it might just be a bad attitude. I've, I've had them. You know, it seems like sometimes you get in that rut, that bad attitude, and just goes on for weeks. You're just grumbling at everything. I don't know why they do this. That was dumb. Can't believe. What, who in the world does that? Why did they say this? You'll find yourself there. You know, I, I find myself there. I said, wait, wait a minute. I got a bad attitude here. That's no way to have church. That's no way to be a Christian. Just a bad attitude. Everything's dumb except you. You know, of course, you're right, you know. But everybody else, what's wrong with them, you know? Just a bad attitude. It could be this. I didn't put this one in your bulletin, but I think it is on the live stream. A, a broken spirit. A broken spirit. You've been hurt. Everybody in here could raise their hand and say, I've been hurt. Everybody could say. Something happened. It could be a relationship or some other tragedy took place, something sorrowful in your life. I've been hurt. i got a broken spirit. But I've been that way. I've been that way as a pastor. I, I remember a guy said some things to me on a Sunday night right before church, and I didn't feel like preaching, just to be honest with you. I just thought, I just want to pray and go home. You know? When the pastor steps to the uh, pulpit and says, we're just going to have testimonies. He's probably got a broken spirit, all right? <laughs> we're just going to have a prayer service tonight, you know? Uh, next time I do that, you'll be like, what's wrong with him? <laughs> just a broken spirit. It might be a broken spirit in your life. Everybody has them, all right? It's just something, that's a wall that hinders you, that stops you uh, from serving uh, the Lord. And so as we consider here, in the, in the history of Israel, this is a pivotal moment for them. I mean, this is, this is like I'm going to the promised land or I'm not right here. And I'm going to say to you and I, this is like are we going to a place of spiritual victory or not? Are, are we, or at some moment, are we going to get past the bitterness or not? Are we going to get past the broken spirit or not? We've got to learn to get past those things if we're going to do anything uh, for Christ. Let me give you just a couple of thoughts here tonight. We're going to go back and look at chapter number 5. If you would, turn back to chapter number 5 with me. Joshua chapter number 5. Uh, there, there are uh, some, in this passage, there are some very valuable lessons that we learn. Some very valuable lessons. All right, Chapter 5 and verse number 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as a captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come 
And Joshua uh, fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua uh, did so. Now here, here's some lessons, number one, about supremacy. About supremacy. Number one, there's a supreme person. This individual that Joshua meets outside the walls of Jericho. Right? Joshua's going in. He's going to spy out the land a little bit. And uh, he, this individual identifies him itself as the captain of the host of the Lord. Now I'm going to tell you what I believe. I believe it's a pre-Bethlehem manifestation and appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's what I believe about that. He says, I'm the captain of the host of the Lord. I believe it was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ standing there, all right? And so there, Joshua came face to face with Christ. Say, so, well, what does this speak about? First of all, it speaks about a matter of salvation. It's a matter of salvation. Listen, before we ever can enjoy victory in the journey, the first thing is salvation. The first thing is salvation. Hey, uh, Caleb and Liam got baptized this morning. Praise the Lord for that. You realize there's a lot of people, though, they've skipped salvation and went right to baptism. They'll never have victory. You got to, you got, hey, you can't make, you can't, you can hit the ball as hard as you want to. But if you skip first base, you don't make a home run. You got to hit first base. You got to hit salvation first, all right? Uh, uh, the, the, the journey begins with salvation. And by the way, let me say this, so winner. Hey, it's not that the, the lost person out there, it's not they need some 12 step program or some self help. They need Jesus, they need salvation. And so when you see uh, a, 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 someone on the street, Maybe they're the drunk on the street or the dope addict on the street or maybe they're having relationship problems. They don't need self-help. They need Jesus. Don't stand there arguing with them about something. Just give them the gospel. That's what they need, amen? And so, hey, the first step is salvation here. It's just a thought here, but notice that Joshua, his encounter with the Lord, in verse number 14, it says he fell on his face to the earth and did worship. I'm going to tell you something. Salvation will make you worship. I tell you what, I get a little bit nervous around people that don't want to worship. I start to question. You say, are you judging them? I'm just watching their fruit. <laughs> Call it what you want, all right? Hey, if you don't want to worship the Lord, I mean, the one that saved your soul, maybe you don't have anything to worship him about, all right? I, hey, listen, he, he fell on his face and he worshiped. All right now, there's a supreme position here. Next, the Lord tells Joshua, He says He's the captain of the Lord's host. That He that it, that is He's the one who is always victorious. He's the one who's walking in victory. Say, so what does this speak about? This speaks about sanctification. We need to come to a place where we recognize that if there will be any victories in our life, they'll come about because of His power. They'll come about because of Him. All right. Not our own. We need to understand that. As by faith, we're going forward, all right? We want to serve the Lord, but the victories we have, it's all because of Him. It's all because of Him. Sanctification is, is us acknowledging Him to be Lord in every area of our life, in every area of our life. Hey, I want to encourage you, Christian, dethrone self uh, off the throne of your heart and put the Savior on. And I tell you what, there's a lot of times in my life, if I be real honest, walking through the day, even in ministry as I go about, I'm looking out for self. We're looking out for self. Uh, this coming up year, I'm going to do a series on the home. I'm going to tell you what a lot of the, the problem in the home is, selfishness. That's where it is. That's where it is. And I have to look at my own self and say, well, there's a lot of times I'm pretty selfish. Amen. You'll be honest. You, that's the same way with you. And so he's talking about sanctification. We're, we're being set apart, all right, uh, for him there. And uh, it's, it's all about uh, him acknowledging that he is Lord. And, uh, man, uh, you know what? You can rest in him. You can rest in him. Uh, the dear mother that uh, her kids had moved across country, they wanted her to come, and, and uh, they wanted her to spend Christmas with them. And they said, Mama, we're going to get you a plane ticket. And boy, she was nervous. 
she was nervous about it. Never been on a plane before. She was nervous. So she got on that plane, and, man, she traveled out across the country and uh, landed and, and uh, got down there, and they, they met her at the gate, and they said, Mama, how was the plane ride? She said, it's okay. She said, I never did put all my weight down, though. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> can I tell you, you can put all your weight down on the Lord. You don't hold back, all right? You can rest in Him. Uh, there's a supreme power here. When Joshua meets this man, there are a couple of things that are strange about it. First of all, there's uh, the Lord's answer to Joshua. Joshua asks who you are. He said, are you, are you for us or against us? And he answers, nay, no. He don't really answer the question. He says, no. And uh, verse number 15, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua uh, did so, all right? Uh, so, you know, it seems strange that he don't really answer the question. He just says, no. In other words, I'm not for them and I'm not for you. That's what he's saying there. I'm not for them and I'm not for you, but you better be on my side. I'm the one in power here. Uh, when he says, take off the shoe there, you know, remember when Moses met God at the burning bush? He told Moses, take off your shoes because you're on the holy ground. Take them both off. Now, here he said, take off your shoe, all right? Why would he do that? Well, it, it comes back to an Old Testament custom. When there was, think about Ruth and Boaz, you remember that story? There was another uh, kinsman there that had first choice before Boaz did. And so Boaz went to him and said, hey, are you going to redeem Ruth? And you remember that the, the kinsman took off his shoe and gave it to him. That was to say, no. He was saying, I can't afford it, I can't do it, I can't redeem her. And so he's, he's submitting, he takes off his shoe, and he's submitting to Boaz and saying, Boaz, you do it, because I can't do it. When Joshua takes off his shoe here, you know what he's saying? He's saying, God, I can't do it. I want to I do something great. I want to live by faith. I want to serve you. But I really can't. He takes off his shoe and says, Lord, here, you're going to have to do it in and through me. And I'm going to tell you, there's going to have to come a point in our lives where we say, Lord, I, I want to do this, but I'm going to have to rest in you. Amen. I'm going to have to realize you have the power to do this. There's a supreme uh, power here. It speaks to us about the matter of surrender, the matter of surrender. When he says, he says no, uh, I, I, I'm not for them, I'm not for you, he's saying you better be on my side, though. Tell you what, I want to be on God's side. You know what? Sometimes we'll say, Lord, bless us. Lord, bless. Here, we made some plans. Bless it. Maybe we ought to say, hey, Lord, what are your plans? I want to do your plans. If we're going to go forward by faith here, all right, we need to make sure we're doing God's plans. We're doing God's plans, all right? And so what a great lesson for the church we we learn that our success, our victory, uh, depends on God, not us. I'm thankful for that. Amen. I'm very, very thankful uh, for that. Number two, all right. There's a lesson about submission here. All right. Let's look at chapter six, verses one through five. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out. None came in. The Lord said to Joshua, "See, I've given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor." You shall compass the city all, ye men of war. Go round about the city once, thus shalt thou do six days. Seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. The seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow uh, with the trumpets. And it, came, uh, it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. And the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. There's a lesson here about submission. Now I want you to think about this. Joshua goes in, spy out the land, meets the captain of the Lord's host. He meets the Lord Jesus Christ. He gets the plan to conquer the city. Here he's coming back. These, these soldiers, these military men, they're sharpening their spears. They're, they're, they're warming up the bows. They're making more arrows. They're getting their armor straight. Joshua says, y'all ready? Yep, we're ready, sir. What are we going to do? Well, 
kind of strange. We're going to go walk around the city. Okay, but when are we going in? Well, we're going to walk around the next day too. All right, when are we going in? Well, we're going to do that for six days. And then on the seventh day, and they're like, hold up, Joshua. No, we're military men. We want to fight. We want to fight. What if those men had said, Joshua, that's embarrassing. I'm not doing that. They'd have never conquered Jericho. There's sometimes the Lord says, hey, this is what you're to do. Our job is not to say, that's embarrassing. No, our job is just to trust and obey. That's our job. Hey, in 2022, I don't know what all the Lord has in store for us, but I know this, we're to trust and obey. We're just to trust and obey. It, he was submissive to God's promises, verses 1 and 2. Joshua goes to battle against the city of Jericho. He's reminded of the Lord's promises that were given in the past, all right, back in Joshua chapter 2. He's reminded in Joshua chapter 6 the, the past promises and the present promises. I tell you what, hey, listen, we ought, we, ought to, we ought to be submissive to God's promises. God has said that you and I can have spiritual victory as we walk this earth. We ought not be telling God how hard it is. We ought just ought to walk into it. Sure, there's giants there. Sure, there's hardships there. But we can have spiritual victory, and we need to be walking into into that. We can look at 1 Corinthians 15, 57. We looked at that this morning that he gives us the victory. All right. Now, he was also submissive to God's plan. Verses 3 all the way to verses 5. I'm sure, as I've already said, as he gave that plan to those military men, that was a little bit strange. All right. It was strange to them. Those seven priests bearing seven trumpets were to walk before the ark. The priests would blow the trumpets and the people would walk behind the, the, them there for those six days. On that seventh day, the wall was going to fall down flat. Well, I tell you what, that was a strange thing. So what was that all about? Well, they, they were to take the seven priests. Seven is the biblical number of completion or fullness. The priests are a picture of our advocate. That's the type of the priest in the Old Testament. We have a high priest, don't we? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they picture there, right? So the, so the seven priests are, are a picture of completion. All right? The priests are a picture of advocate who stand between uh, us. And according to the Bible, the saints have that perfect advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ. They were to take seven ram's horns, trumpets. The ram was a picture of atonement. You remember Isaac? Abraham took Isaac up there. What took Isaac's place? That ram caught in the thicket. Took his place today. It's a picture of atonement, right? It was a ram that provided that for it. So it's a picture of atonement. They were to take the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark represents the Lord Jesus Christ in his fullness. There was the, the pot of manna there. Uh, there was Aaron's rod that budded there. Uh, that spoke of Christ's power in his life. That, that dead rod that budded, that speaks of the power of God. There was the, there was the, uh, the, the tables, the law there that was given. That speaks of a, the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the law for you and I. Amen? And so the idea here is that Jesus is all we need to wage battle with. That's all we need. Church, let's be careful. Let's, let's be careful not to get caught up in marketing our church. I want to have good literature. Don't get me wrong. I want to have a good website. In this day and age, we do live stream. I want it to be good. I, I, want, I want it to be the best that we can do. All right? I want it to be the best that we can. We ought to do that because we're representing Christ. But you know what? They don't need a, us to market. They need us to give the gospel. We're to, we're to give the gospel out. Right? We need to be careful. They were simply to take those things and walk around, uh, the, around the city. God promised them that the walls of Jericho would fall down as a result. In other words, all they had to do was have confidence in God's plan. All we have to do is have confidence in God's plan. I don't need something else. I don't need something new. Be careful about new things. I like the old past myself. I like a King James Bible myself. I, I, I like the old hymns of the faith, amen? I, like, I, I, don't, I don't want a song book where they take the word blood out because it's offensive. I, 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 want, I, want, uh, I want the old ways. I, I don't care if you call it old-fashioned. I'm old school. I'm old school, amen? Hey, listen, I, I, I praise the Lord that, uh, there, you know what, when we talk about 
when we talk about people like John R. Rice and Jack Hiles, Spurgeon, D.L. Moody, I'm not trying to glorify a man. I'm just saying, you know what? These men did it according to the Bible, and it worked. Uh, I, I, I pastored there, the West Side Baptist Church, and Dr. James Crumpton had pastored that church before me some 57 years. I mean, a man of God. I can think about one time that I, I, I was just, him and I were sitting and praying. We were in the old West Side building that was downtown Natchez there. We were in the auditorium there, and he bowed his head that he prayed first. And I, I know it's not about a feeling. I know that. But man, it gave me a feeling. I, I think I looked around, I thought, I'm about to I'm about to see Jesus. I feel the Holy Spirit here. And I, I tell you what, I know he's not perfect. I know John R. Rice wasn't perfect, but I tell you what, if you can pray and give me a feeling like that, I'll follow you. How about that? <laughs> I'm gonna stick with the old ways. I, I all this these I hate this. The new independent Baptist. I don't know who they are. I'm going to stick with the old King James and, and Baptist doctrine. I'm good with that, amen? Right. That works, all right? I tell you what, I don't need something new. I just need to follow what this book says. I just need to follow it. Jericho was a city, about nine acres. It had taken about 30 minutes to walk around it. So they got up, lined up, and marched around the city and went home. All they did was walk. That's all they did. What a lesson for us, amen? Just follow the scriptures. Just walk in the old paths. If the book says do it, do it. Amen. If it says, hey, this is a sin, don't do it. Right. It's really that simple. I mean, I, I get concerned about people say, well, I just don't know. Maybe you don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling you to enlighten you on this scripture. Maybe you just need a good old dose of you must be born again. I'm not trying to be offensive to you. I'm just trying to help you tonight, all right? If there's something here, say, like, oh, if it's always, why is it always, well, how can we get around this? You know? How about this one? You hear this one? Well, that's under the law. <sighs> I want, immediately, when, when, when it, somebody says that, a pastor automatically thinks, what are you trying to get away with? Because <laughs> realize this, before the, before the law was given, the Levitical law, God's always had a moral law. I don't know. Did we preach this recently or was I just preaching this in my mind? I'm going to preach it again, all right? <laughs> Thou shalt not kill. You're not supposed to kill, right? Thou shalt not lie, all right? Well, well what if I said, what do you mean I can't kill somebody? Yeah, I'm not under the law. I'm under grace now. I can do it no, what if, I, what if I just lied straight to your face? You say, well, the preacher lied. I know, but I'm not under the law. We don't say that, do we? No. Well, that is, that was in the law, but it's also God's moral law. It's God's moral law. Hey, there's a way that I'm supposed to live, all right? Just follow the Bible. That's really easy, all right? I get it. Christianity, living the Christian life, it is a tough one. It is tough, but it's a peaceful life. It's a peaceful life. So how do you do that? Go with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter 2, and probably we could quote this verse. You probably can quote it. Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. Listen to what he says there, Galatians 2, 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know what Paul said? He said, it's not me, it's Christ. I'm not living for self, I'm living for Jesus. I allow him to live in and through me. That's being uh, Christ's life. What a, what a great lesson for us. He was submissive to God's power there. Uh, in uh, verse number 5, uh, he, he submitted to God's power. Israel was about to learn the truth that victory was in the Lord and not in uh, themselves. Very quickly, the third thing we see here is this. In chapter 6, and we're not going to read all these verses from, from verse number 6 all the way to verse number 21, there's a lesson here about success. 
the, the lesson about success. The people of Israel received the fulfillment of the Lord's promise to them, and there's a lot of truths for us. First of all, success involved determination. They simply did it God's way. They simply did it God's way. Don't you imagine as those soldiers are marching around, they're marching around the city, they have their armor, they have everything, they're tempted to go, can I just shoot an arrow in there? I mean, they're tempted like, this doesn't make sense. You know, just, I, I just need to do that. No, they, I'm sure they were tempted to fight, but they said, you know what? I'm determined to do it God's way. Amen. South Shore Baptist Church, we better be determined to do it God's way. I'm not looking to the world to build a church. Mm -mm. No, uh, success involved determination to do it the right way, to do it God's way, all right? Success involved dedication. Israel walked around the city six days. On the sixth day, what happened? Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing happened when they walked around six days. You know why? Six days represents the number of man, doesn't it? Nothing's going to happen if we try to do it in man's strength. But on that seventh day, that represents God. It's just showing that God's power is what they needed. Verse number 21, verse number 21, and they utterly, chapter 6, verse 21, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city. Listen to this. Both man and woman young and old and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. Well, that doesn't seem fair, does it? I've had a lot of conversations of that verse right there. That doesn't seem real fair, does it? He said, I want you to kill man, woman, little boy, little girl, sheep, ox, everything. That's what he says. Success involved Death. After the walls fell down, the Israelites went into Jericho and killed everything with the exception of Rahab and her family. I know it seems extreme. We look at that. But I want you to realize this. God understood that it wasn't about those walls. The city were the people there. The city was the people that had an ideology that had to die. An ideology that had to die. Can I tell you? If you want to do something great for the Lord, you're going to have to hack sin to death. Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, Agag the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately, and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord, in Gilgad. Agag is a picture of the flesh. And the flesh has to be defeated. If you're going to go forward by faith, the flesh, it has to be defeated. That is a daily battle. That's real easy preaching. Oh, I could preach that all over the place, but tomorrow's called Monday, 7 a.m. <laughs> you're going to wake up and you're going to deal with the flesh. And I'm going to, you're going to have to crucify the flesh. You have to crucify uh, that flesh in your life. You think about this passage here, and we certainly will continue next week. But I tell you what, I want to do something for Christ. There, are, every one of us have a wall that we face, not a physical wall, but a spiritual battle that rages. It could be that bitterness, maybe something way in the past that happened to you. You're bitter about that. I, I understand those things. Maybe it is that bad attitude. You just get that way sometimes. Sometimes I, I talk to my pastor friends. I say, I don't know what's wrong with me. I just had a bad attitude for two weeks. <laughs> I remember a couple months ago I told a guy, that I was like, man, I've had a bad attitude for two weeks. Man, I, I, I'm broken. I just got a broken spirit. I, I mean, I'll get to doing something for the Lord. I say, Lord, why did you let this happen to me? We've all been there. We're never going to do anything by faith if those walls hinder us. You've got to start and say, Lord, I, I want to get rid of this. I remember my good friend, Brother Mike Smith. He wrote some things down on a piece of paper. 
several sheets of paper, things that had happened to him. There were some names of people there that had wronged him. He went out back. This is in Alabama, so you could do this out there. You can do it in Mississippi, too. Went out back to the burn barrel. You know what I'm talking about? That's why we used to burn trash, you know. He said, I started a fire, and I prayed. I said, Lord, i got to get rid of this. And he put all those pieces of paper, just kind of signifying, I'm done. I'm done with that. Maybe we need to do that. If we're going to do anything in the year 2022, there's some things that we kind of got to get rid of. Get rid of. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We have a verse of invitation tonight. Just want to encourage.